name is Ola Madsen, and I'm a professor here at the Department of Materials and Blocks. Uh, and I've been appointed to be the moderator of, the, uh, of this event here. Uh, so my task is actually to introduce all of you to who the persons are here. And first of all, I'd like to introduce Emma, who is the uh, main person here today, who will present his PhD thesis called uh, Virtual Factories as System Systemic Approach to building smart factories. So I really look forward to, to your presentation here. Uh, you have been de employed by the Department of Materials Production. You've done your PhD on the main, the main program. Uh, and you've done that in collaboration with the uh, So uh, we'll hear from you in a moment. Then we also have the assessment committee uh, consisting of Professor Emeritus Ron Sanchez from Copenhagen Business School. Uh, in Denmark, but you are not in Denmark at the moment. Uh, you're far away in, in, in the morning in, in the US somewhere. In Oregon, USA. Okay, so it's morning on, on your side. So good morning to you and, and, you. and welcome to this uh, section, session. Um, Thank you. The second member is Professor Peter Gorm Larsen from Aarhus University. So welcome to you. Uh, and finally, we have Anne Louise Anderson uh, here from Auburn University. And I believe you're the chairman of the um, assessment committee. Chairman, yes. Uh, chairwoman. <laughs> um, we also have some supervisors. Uh, so we have Charles, Charles Miller, who's been your main supervisor, I believe. Um, and we also have Anne Bilber, who has co supervised, been your co supervisor. And we have Arne uh, with us uh, online. Yeah, and then finally, welcome to all of you uh, for coming here for, for this session here. Um, before I leave the floor to you, let me just remind you of the rules that we have for these uh, uh, PhD sessions here. So what will happen is that we will present for 45 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a small break, so those of you who will not stay here for the whole session will have time to, to uh, do something else. Um, otherwise, the rest of us can stretch our legs. And then we return back here at 4 o'clock uh, for the questioning round, where the assessment committee has time to ask questions. Um, this will take maximum two hours. So uh, one of my hard obligations will be to stop you if it runs beyond two hours. Uh, there will also be a chance to take questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, you should come to me in the break <laughs> we have after Elmo's presentation. And then we will schedule the, the questions you might have. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it from me now. So um, I will leave the floor to you. And I really look forward to, to your presentation. So enjoy. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today I will talk about my PhD journey. It took more than three years, so it will be a bit more, you know, quick uh, presentation about three years' journey, what we faced, uh, what we discovered, what we learned. So. The content is simply I will first talk about the introduction, the context of our research. Then uh, we will go to the, some challenges and problems and research motivation. And then we will look at the, some objectives and questions we try to you know, uh, address during this research. Afterwards, shortly the methodology. And if you are still alive, we will look at the results and uh, hopefully have some fun videos about uh, my work. And lastly, we will have some discussions mainly try to uh, look at what that means, uh, this uh, research means for the industry and academia. So, as uh, Ole mentioned, uh, this is a main project, Manufacturing Academy of Denmark, and uh, I was hired by Oldenburg University, and the Vestas was named industry stakeholder, and the project developed between these three stakeholders called Smart Factories. So I also partially work with Nestec, and collaborate between these main stakeholders uh, during these three years. So we start with a frame. You see, this is not very traditional research. I did not come uh, propose a research subject and get a grant for it. 
but there was already a research package with a framework. Uh, we call that some expectations. I put some of them here. As you can see, they asked me to focus factories, digitalization, digital infrastructure, the data there, and uh, what kind of values we can capture from this data with uh, solutions, means of digital technologies. Uh, the first phase in the May is the idea generation. Look at the industry, find a problem, uh, define the objectives of a solution, and design a solution. And the second phase, the most important, may be to prove the concept. It's not just a theoretical work. Develop a demo, put it in the industrial case, and uh, evaluate it. And if it is still valuable, then it can be a prototype and maybe an actual solution uh, in the industry in the long run. So, of course, uh, this proof of concepts first two phases iterative. We can go in the first time and find some issues, go back to the uh, original idea or the solution or the objectives. So proof of criteria, since we try to solve an actual problems in the industry, the main criteria is the utility, usefulness of the solution. And is it useful and effective enough to solve some actual issues and hopefully there should be a business value. So our project scope is looking this first two phases. So then simply we have the objectives. First one, design some artifacts, concepts, models, architectures for industrial problems. And the second one, develop and demonstrate these concepts in the industrial cases and evaluate them to, you know, does that work? Uh, or to what extent do they work uh, and the impactful? And the fourth one, of course, disseminate, share the knowledge, share the learnings of this uh, work. So the problems. We have some challenges. You know, I look to factories, manufacturing systems are my core uh, research area in this uh, research time, uh, for three years time. We have three domains in manufacturing. One is obviously product, we have to produce and deliver, and the uh, corresponding processes to produce them. And also, of course, the manufacturing systems here representing factories through resources there. So they are quite tightly related with each other, but story does not end there. We have product service system. We have to, especially in wind turbine case, transport them, install and service. So these are also widely related with supply chains, inbound and outbound, of course, under enterprise strategy. All these domains covered by market dynamics, which are becoming quite important for us because, for example, the demand impact. Unfortunate events in Ukraine, for example, now creating a pressure on the demand of wind energy. And there are time to market, we have to deliver our products quite fast. There are disruptive technologies impacting different areas of our operations. And of course, cost pressure and some regulations, especially in the wind industry, there are some weight and size issues that we cannot uh, bend. Uh, and most importantly, localization requirements. This is a bit unique. Maybe I can tell you what. So if you simply sell a, turb a couple of turbines and win the project, for example, we won uh, one in New York. Uh, if it is $2.5 billion, for example, then the government jump in and say, wait a second, if we have to pay so much money to a Danish company, you have to make some investments here, create some jobs. So it affects quite much already complex and difficult supply chains. Wind turbines I worked. You see here the picture is the blue marlin is our upcoming product. It's a 15 megawatt turbine, it's one of the biggest will be on, on, on offshore. End of this year, we will have first prototype. Why it's the biggest? Because very simple physics rule. The area that wind blade covers is called swept area. If it is bigger, we capture more static uh, power from the wind, so we can create more energy from this with the same turbine. So that means turbine performance will increase. Why this is so important also? Why not we put more turbines? Because we don't not actually sell turbines we go and give cost per megawatt. Whoever gives lower cost per megawatt was likely to win the tender. So if turbines have higher performance, which means they are bigger, then you are most likely to win the tender. That's why turbines are getting bigger and bigger and heavier and more complex. This is the mold of that turbine, 115 meters. So these are simple graphs showing how they have, uh, the swept area size goes upwards, rotor diameter, and the weight this is actually the nacelle weight there, it's not updated. Nacelle is a simple box on top of these towers. The blue marlin nacelle, when it's fully loaded, will be uh, 600 tons, more than 600 tons. And while this is happening, the cost goes down. That creates huge pressure. 
full tower of blue marlin, which is one megaton. The blades are the lightest components of a turbine. The blue marlin, one blade transport tools reach 50 tons. So overall turbine will reach two megaton. These are quite a big challenge. So simply the products are changing. So when they are changing, we have to consider the processes we produce them and deliver them and transport. So when these are changing, also we have to consider our systems to handle these chains. So this is called coordinated or concurrent evolution, or in other words, co-evolution. So this doesn't, of course, have to be triggered just by products. It can be just a new technology or new regulation. So long story short, uh, markets are evolving, and this evolution uh, impacts us in, a, in terms of co-evolution in manufacturing. So that's become a challenge because we had it actually a long time, we were handling it because now we cannot, the complexity increasing. We also have another issue, we have shorter life cycles. We have to deliver much bigger, heavier, and much complex turbines faster than ever before. It's not all bad though, we have some opportunities. So we have this dynamic, complex models in products, processes, and systems, but this means, okay, computer screens simply not good enough to deal with this dynamic complex models, but we have virtual reality that allows us more immersive interfaces. Digital twin is a quite uh, important technology and quite popular and buzzwords uh, used everywhere. Why it is important? Because even the, the word when we say virtual in the dictionary, it sounds opposite of real or digital. But what makes those data and model in the digital platforms or virtual environments is the link between them with their real counterparts. So there is manufacturing data analytics, advanced manufacturing data analytics also very important, simply because mathematics has no mercy. And the 3D simulations are getting very advanced because they allows us to create these environments in, you know, more immersively and allows us to integrate different technologies like digital twin and the virtual reality and also different methods. So why we need them, not to kick everyone out from the systems then they let them do everything themselves is actually create new skills. We need them to use them also train new workers. So still we need to know how these new technologies uh, should be combined and managed successfully to handle the issues which we are facing now and in the future. We need to investigate also this uh, impact effects of this technological developments and in terms of operational management and business competitiveness. So I want to say a few things about digital twin. That's an old definition made by NASA. There are already quite some uh, you know, critics about this definition, some updates called. So it simply says the digital twin, an integrated simulation, probabilistic simulation has sensors data and mirroring the life of its corresponding uh, system. So one critics, for example, when we look at this class, classifying these uh, models and physical and digital models in terms of data integration, if we simply get data manually from the physical and send the results back from digital manually, it is not a digital twin, just a digital model. If we gather data automatically, but send the results back manually, then it's just a digital shadow. But if we have the directional automated data integration, then it's a digital twin. Unfortunately, in literature, many uh, researchers actually just focus on digital shadow or digital models. So in our solutions, we try to achieve this data integration between digital simulations and reality, not directly by our manufacturing execution system. But uh, we also test with the IP uh, to prove that it can achieve the entire link by a mess to physical objects. That time I couldn't do it because simply there was not a connected machine in the factories I was working on. So smart factories, title of my research. What is it? This is just one definition. There are many out there. All of them have slight differences, but simply when we look what are the capabilities, smart factories are context aware uh, systems. They can understand the, the manufacturing systems problems and develop solutions and implement them. So how we can achieve it? Some say it's the virtual factory is a way to go there in terms of visualization and data integration, data utilization. But I could even add this, there is also virtual factories capability to different technology integration. Because for smart factories, we need so many technologies. We need artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, VR, digital twin, and also different methods. 
What is virtual factory? When I look at the virtual factory literature, I found so many different models, concepts, frameworks, and the quite old ones. And it goes all the way back to 1993, it's mentioned. It's quite old, 30 years old. And the, one of the recent ones, 20 years ago, the, the, uh, the literature defined virtual factory as an integrated simulation model of a factory, considering its subsystems as a whole and uh, support advanced decision uh, capability. So when I map them, we see all research actually on different uh, distinct perspectives of virtual uh, factories, different technologies, and some are the pilot works or lab works, some are the actual cases. The idea was that why don't we bring these different technologies together and have this solution put in the actual uh, real life case and to explore what kind of uh, usefulness we can capture from this. So we find various needs, gaps from the literature that we can address with this work. I will not go through all of them. But first, we said to answer those, uh, close these gaps, we need to design a concept and based on real life cases and then um, which can utilize different technologies and especially product process and uh, system models in it. And then we want to discover how can we actually develop and implement it because that was a need that the guidelines for the, the actual guys and experts in the industry. And third one, of course, find the evaluate, uh, find the enablers and barriers and evaluate it in the, in the industrial purposes and discover the value is if there is any. So we create some questions. First one looking how can we develop this concept and uh, with the state of the art technologies for an industrial case. Second one was extending with digital twin capability and multi-user VR and evaluate it uh, to put it in support industry for handling coevolution. This is quite a generic question. Actually, I could consider it the overall question of all my PhD. And the third question derived from the first two, actually during the research, it's, it is uh, it's shaped and updated. We try, we thought that, you know, we are talking so generic things. We need to evaluate in the specific cases. So during this research, we, uh, we get uh, feedback from industry experts, new product in production, NPI processes could be quite valuable to evaluate because NPI is uh, in terms of a change has the highest magnitude in the manufacturing organization to, to need to change the whole new product and new processes and new production systems. And the last one is also a result from all this work. It wasn't intended in the beginning. We find out that there is actually quite few research considering or discussing the conceptual or theoretical background of this concept and solution based on what theories and concepts this could be useful. So we thought that it would be nice to also focus so we break down all questions. I will not go through all of them, uh, not to make you bored more. So first phase, we had three phase and each phase, so we simply had same processes, design, develop, demonstrate and evaluate and disseminate what you find out. First phase focused on building the concept and uh, developing it in the industrial case and see where are the values. Second phase, we thought that we needed to extend the capabilities, technological capabilities and with the digital twin and multi-user VR. And the last phase, we tried to put in the specific case and virtual prototyping for NPI. So the first paper addressed some of the gaps we find in the beginning, as I showed before. And the second one and other ones, uh, these are more like practical uh, uh, challenges and gaps. And then we put a more specific evaluation and the last paper, uh, try to address some needs in terms of theoretical and conceptual foundations. So about the methodology. So we follow design science research methodology because, you know, we have three dom uh, two domains mainly. One is application case, which is industry, rest us. Another one is knowledge base, which is the scientific uh, papers out there. We need to design, find a problem in industry and uh, design, design a solution based on existing knowledge and test it and send it back. But let's look how it looks uh, in our context. We have some uh, you know, capabilities, problems, <coughs> and uh, strategies in Vestas, and we have existing knowledge in the literature, some theories, concepts, and models. 
So what we did in our cycles, first we found the problem in the industry, capital <coughs> requirements, and then we look at the literature, what is existing knowledge there, what are the existing concepts, models, and how can we utilize this knowledge. And then we design a solution based on this. <coughs> and then this is also maybe important. We try to <coughs> and ground the design decisions. Why we designed the solution in this way. And fifth step, going back to the application domain in the industry partner and demonstrating it uh, in actual case. And the, the knowledge we gain from these demonstrations, we evaluate our design. And of course, share what we learned with the academia. But also another last and critical one, we try to look back, does this answer the questions we asked in the beginning? So there are six processes in design science. We follow these six steps uh, for each cycle, each phase. I will not again go all the details, but each phase we simply try to utilize uh, some problems, capabilities, strategies from our industrial partner. And also we try to use existing knowledge in terms of theories, methods, and gaps. So first phase, we follow them. And what we learn in the first phase, we up update our objectives and design and make another evaluation. Based on that, we change our objectives, make a specific evaluation. So let's look at a bit uh, what we did in solution time. So factories are highly complex systems. But what is it in a system in the first time? A system consists of several essential parts and all subsystems. So each uh, part affects the performance, essential properties of the system, of the whole. But no part have independent impact on the whole. So if you look, for example, uh, my body, if I want to run fast, I uh, simply having more longer or stronger legs are not enough. My heart should be strong enough to support uh, for, my, for my body to run faster. Even my brain maybe should be you know, strong enough to manage this process. So the parts doesn't have independent impact in the overall uh, performance. That's why a system is not the collection of its parts. A system is the product of the interaction of its parts. So what we're dealing here, factories simply highly complex and evolving systems of actively interacting problems. Traditionally, we deal with this problem by analysis approach by simply layering down these complex systems in different la uh, layouts. For example, in factories, we have exact sheets, but in timelines, we have 2D drawings looking to the, the, the layout. Other drawings about just process flows. Simply these start failing more and more because of increasing complexity. That's why we need a synthesis approach as a complementary to this analysis approach. So we design the concept. We have two life cycles. One is a product life cycles and another one is production life cycle. When there is a change in product, process or systems, we have to go through these life cycles to update our existing uh, system. One side, we have a real factory with some IT infrastructure capturing the data from what's happening actually there, representing our system. Another side, we have really comprehensive PLM solutions representing our product model. So, and in between, we have put the virtual factory. It's an integrated simulations representing the factory. But as I said, when we consider them working these domains individually and isolate independently, then it doesn't uh, work well. Because whenever we change the product, we have to go to processes and then the reality. So that's why we aim to linking them in real time. So we try to achieve with virtual factory a dynamic representation. What it means. So in reality, everything is dynamic. You go to factory, you don't see the things, the layout as in the drawing in the 2D uh, system or the product cats standing in some corners. Everything is moving, everything is changing. So that creates one issue. We try to achieve a dynamic representation of actual reality with virtual factories. Another one is open. So every system is open actually, like production lines or factories. They are getting some inputs, like tools, resources, labor force, and ideas, and give some outputs. So, but most of our existing IT platforms are not that open. The PLM has its own complex product models, engineering or bill of materials, manufacturing bill of materials. We try to have design, have a solution which is open to other integrations. The holistic, which I mentioned also, 
looking some specific part independently solving problem there is not enough because mostly it creates a chain of reaction if i change some part of the production mostly i have to update the delivery system from warehouse then warehouse and maybe all the way to supply chain so here we try to represent the whole system in a solution cognitive is a bit tricky word it's simply easy to make sense so we have this really complex detailed engineering models in different platforms and all specialists in their own area did a great job, but the organizations doesn't work that, people doesn't work independently. That should be, to some extent, easy to understand and comprehend uh, people from different departments. So as a result of this, we also thought that maybe the definition of virtual factory should be updated. So we propose the definition. So virtual factories are not just integrated simulations. Virtual factories are now becoming an Im immersive virtual environment where we can create digital twins, all factory entities, and we can relate them, create them, simulate them, and I think most importantly, we can manipulate them. So this is the video I um, developed four years ago. First time 3D discrete event simulation. That blue thing moving on there is a CAD model of an actual wind turbine. So when I did it, uh, it, it was amazing. I thought, okay, if I can put one part of a turbine, so I can, you know, put the actual layout and create actual walls, factories, tools, environment, processes, and link them with different platforms. So I would have a virtual twin of reality. So then we did. We get an actual layout, actual CAD models, and we link them with each other. What you see here actually quite an old and um, after a month of uh, fight with legal department, I, allowed, I was allowed to publish. So that's the tip of the iceberg, but I'm sure it will help you to understand what we mean. So simply, we, are, we built a factory with different components, with different perspectives. Each of data come from different guys. We link them, we try to achieve different unique processes there. Then we simply try to have product process and system models integrated with each other. We import data from real manufacturing, manufacturing execution system and actual production. So what you see here is not just a 3D discrete event simulation of a production. The old data for these processes came from factories in real time. So when the production stopped in factory, it doesn't work in the simulation, which has happened. We thought it was an error, but then we find out that it was an actual purpose of our work. Then we can run some data analytics. And most beautiful part, what is the purpose of having such a good exact model? We can manipulate it. While this line is running, I was able to change the location of the operations, and I was able to see the real-time impact of this change in the data analytics part. It's not just 3D fancy thing though. You can go inside with virtual reality, verify, analyze the processes. The whole line, I thought uh, the operations in the line were virtual twin, except one. One operation we assigned a VR user, he has to perform the assembly task for a training purposes, but because it was in the virtual factory, we were able to real time observe his uh, impact of his performance to the production line. So if he does not finish task on time virtually, he will block the line. And our factory manager will get so angry that then automatically we send results back to the manufacturing execution system. So I will jump to another one. Actually, so we made another simulation. One operation in that line, we have to coordinate. I mean, operators have to coordinate in one process, and also one of them has to coordinate with other. David from Denmark, uh, from Portugal, and I was in Denmark. It wasn't me; it's my avatar. Uh, we met in one virtual environment, 
we were hear each other, talk with each other, and we have to perform a process in a much more higher resolution in this multi-user VR simulation. The time clock you see on that wall, it's coming from actual production. It's actually showing the, the time um, of an operation just before this one. So simply again, if we do not finish our task on time, we will be virtually blocking the line. So we did not just perform this process, we record our, in this case, proof of concept, our time to finish it. And in that previous line simulation, we utilize our uh, time. We, you know, we perform to finish this task. Simply, if the training, during the train, training, if the people takes longer time to finish task, so that time will be used in the line simulation so we could see how would it impact the whole line. So these are all on YouTube, by the way, you can watch all of them. So let's look at the results. First phase, we published a paper focusing on building the virtual factory, the journal paper, and the second phase, we extended it and a bit more extensive, extensive work related because the question was big and broad, you know, could this support for evolution? And the virtual prototyping, uh, we focused on the specific cases of a uh, new product introduction. And the last one in the theory papers, and we focused a bit conceptual and theoretical foundations here. And the, the paper actually was updated uh, at the same in the, the thesis. Past the minor revision, hopefully, it will be the last one. We also introduced, of course, various uh, artifacts. I will not go and try to explain all of them, but we simply try to put there our methods, our procedures we follow during this work, what we learn from the industry, architectures. These could be, of course, um, a bit specific to Westas, but it could be extended to different industries. This is, for example, architecture for multi user virtual reality. And of course, some evaluations and feedbacks from industry experts. So these are some simple graphs I put here, but there are actually quite nice comments uh, to elaborate on this solution. What would it mean for the industry? So lastly, also we look at the theoretical and conceptual foundations. We elaborate on this, and also we try to extend our uh, solution to virtual enterprise. I will come to that a little bit later. So. We say that virtual factory is a systemic way, a systemic approach to build smart factories. What that means, the factories are really not just uh, static systems or IT systems or mechanical systems. They are highly dynamic, evolving, complex, social technical, social economic and artificial systems. If we isolate these parts of these systems independently, so it will be challenging to handle the change. That's why now with the systemic approach, we can divide the, the system in a different layers, look at the uh, parts in different level of resolutions, while we can see still the impacts of this change in different levels. So simply systemic approach means that just a way to handle a complex system with a global point of view without focusing on uh, some specific details. So it also aims for a better understanding of complexity without simplifying the reality too much. So it's simply looking, focusing the conception and the communication of complexity. So we do not look independent parts and factors when we look in the whole system. We are looking the goals and interaction. And of course, the most importantly, we can look essential properties and emerging properties uh, to handle co-evolution. And how we do it, process rendezvous we call. Production and pro product and production life cycle processes can meet in virtual factories so we can see how will it work or not in virtual factory. So by achieving architectural isomorphism uh, between the models from product, process and systems. So come back to questions we addressed in the beginning. We try to answer each one of them in different papers. The first one we try to simply propose, introduce new concept, methodologies, procedures, architecture, and using VR in computer-aided manufacturing. And paper two focusing the extension of digital twin and multi-user VR and evaluating the solution in the evolution context, also concurrent engineering and time to market. 
to predict also uh, evolution of our artifacts, of course. Paper three focusing is demonstrating in this virtual prototyping cases and uh, evaluating this specifically for uh, NPI processes and especially four different types of prototyping uh, during the introduction of new prototy uh, prototypes. It has really quite an interesting feedbacks there, which areas it could be more valuable or what type of simulations could be more valuable for each case. Fourth paper, we try to introduce conceptual and theoretical frame and extend the solution to enterprise level, not just uh, limited from factories, which is actually our, our actual real work with this investors, uh, the operations of outside factory, and of course, uh, elaboration of the solution based on the concepts. Future works. What we have, digital twin based factory was not just a nice looking solution in West uh, The moment actually I finished my PhD uh, a year ago, the West decided to invest in this. We had a quite comprehensive simulation solution, integrated simulations in left phase. So we finalized the installation uh, of that solution and it's live since February in West so now the integration with different platforms with the manufacturing execution system, which is at Wizzle, and our PLM solutions is going on. So we will hopefully soon be able to create digital tooling based virtual factory models uh, to simulate processes, verify, validate, and hopefully optimize. And extension to virtual enterprise. This is actually now our work that uh, we simply, as soon as we come to the end of the research, we realize that factories, of course, super critical and important, but especially in an industry like Vestas, the value chain itself, I mean, the same principles force us to consider outside operations outside of the factory. We simply try to simulate now our supply chain inbound and outbound, and also specific operations in the transportation, for example, pre-assembly operations in different harbors and installation of turbines. That's why we also now particularly working on multi-resolution supply chain simulations together with a participant here, uh, Patrick, he's a master's student. We had some uh, solutions, I will also show you uh, about that shortly. Also, we are looking at reconfigurable manufacturing systems with Stefan here as a PhD candidate. With him, we, he's working in uh, RMS. We are trying to simulate uh, reconfigurable <coughs> manufacturing systems in virtual factory simulations to verify uh, the solutions in advance. Multi-user VR, another critical thing, you know, like a company like Vestas, we have factories all around the world, China, India, Brazil, America, and uh, so on and so forth. So we have to collaborate a lot. And it's not just in our side of working with different people in different departments, it's that different parts of the world. They have to come together, find solutions to these challenges we actually I mentioned for multi-user, uh, VR can provide us a sort of platform that people can come together, design the factories, simulate them, verify them, and maybe hopefully implement them to reality. So this was the concept which we developed. In the future works, we just extended it to enterprise level and put some simulations operations outside of the factory. And that uh, paper we just submitted uh, to a conference in Euroma at uh, Berlin. It's accepted. Hopefully, it will be presented uh, and uh, online near future. So, I want to show a little bit outside of the factories. So, we are having projects in different parts of the world. Suddenly, we have to establish a huge assembly site in the harbor of New York. So, we have to create a new supply chain. We have to transport things on the harbors and from the other harbor, have some operations there and then send them to offshore locations to installation. So this is for a uh, demo for the Blue Marlin case. Uh, the, another critical thing maybe, this tool, for example, Patrick learned this tool, uh, while he was learning this tool, he was developing this solution. It took just two weeks. It's not just because we are genius, we do it so fast. It's because these solutions, these technologies becoming so easy to use, easy to learn, then model the future scenarios. We put the estimations, the parameters, they are not always fixed parameters. Mostly they have huge deviations. So when we bring them from Excel to this kind of models, suddenly we have a quite you know, integrated model, uh, model and integrating different data across the 
manufacturing of the chain. And we can have a better forecast about the future. Of course, the ultimate parameter in business is the money. So we can put some cost parameters and see the, in, uh, the cost of the scenarios which we have in our mind, of course, for different cases. So in the simulation, we can, of course, look at different data analytics and look at different parts of the operation. But as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not just a part. We can just uh, use the data at the end as a plan to uh, execute, or we can see the bottlenecks in our value chain uh, in the future. So we can consider some handling some big issues, failures, and challenges far ahead uh, we are facing them. So if there are so many parameters in the simulation, of course, as I, as I said, they are not just uh, fixed parameters, there are deviations. We can also change the parameters in the simulation and directly see the impact of those changes in the model. This is actually quite useful for quite a comprehensive models, which different people from different departments work, have to work together. So, if you have so many parameters and if you try to uh, have, uh, go for different ideas, it becomes difficult to go change each parameter one by one and look at them. We can create different scenarios and for each scenario, we can determine the parameters. And because there are deviations, we can run each scenario a couple of times simultaneously and see the, uh, the average outcomes of each scenario based on our predefined performance uh, criteria. So that was all, actually. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I have to say thank you, first, Manufacturing Academy of Denmark, Vestas, and Inestec to help us uh, to fund and provide the materials, this research. I'm very much appreciated for this support. And of course, my supervisor, Professor Charles Muller, and Associate Professor Arne Bilberg for their supervision during this uh, research uh, mine. That was it. Thank you very much.